So, Willie, uh, here we have uh, in the Wall Street Journal uh, the words that a lot of soccer fans are thinking about this morning, football fans. Today, it is win or go home at the World Cup for Team USA. It is, Joe. It's on all the newspapers here in New York, too. This is the back page of the New York Post. It says, weight of the world. The Daily News <laughs> going a step further. The end of the world, meaning oh, if the US, okay. USA loses today, it's the end of their run in the World Cup. But there's, of course, okay. a lot more than soccer uh, in the background here. Team USA's fate at the World Cup resting on a must-win match against Iran this afternoon. A draw or a loss today eliminates the American team after the Americans tied both Wales and England. Let's Good. This should be uh, quite a fascinating match. Yeah, and the Iranians, of course, defeated Wales in their second game, while the U.S. only managed a draw uh, with the Welsh squad. This will be a tight match. Both teams still alive to head to the knockout round with a win. And it's, it's pretty simple. There's no loss, obviously, knocks the U.S. out, but so does a draw. It's not a question of goal differential either. It's simply win and you're in. The stakes are high, obviously. And the relations between these two countries, mm, not exactly warm uh, right now and have not been for a very long time. Uh, so we can ask Jimmy Carter about that. Uh, and certainly, Willie, we also know that there's reports that the Iranians if the day were not if they were caught not seeing the national anthem there's some reporting out there that their families back home would be threatened so there's a lot of, mm. at, at stake here beyond even what we're going to see on the pitch they've been put on notice we've got megan fitzgerald's audio back she's in doha qatar i'll let you pick it up megan yeah, guys, you know, you're absolutely right. You just talked about how this is such a crucial game for Team USA, but then you think about the mental game as well. There's so much going on off the pitch that they're wrapped up in as well. I mean, the U.S. Soccer Federation, for example, just the other day removing the Islamic Republic emblem from the Iranian flag from the team's social media accounts. Uh, and the Iranians not happy about that. Taking to Twitter, calling on FIFA uh, to suspend Team USA for 10 games, to kick them out of the World Cup. Then, of course, yes. Yesterday, we saw this press conference, this really hotly contested press conference between uh, team captain uh, Tyler Adams and the head coach of Team USA being grilled by these uh, members of the Iranian state media, uh, so much so that the coach even apologized for the actions of the U.S. Soccer Federation, even though the team and the coach said they knew nothing about those actions. Uh, and then, of course, we saw the team captain being grilled about discrimination in the United States and how he can play for the U.S under, you know, the fact that there's, you know, challenges in the U.S. with black Americans. And so, you know, these players are now dealing with a lot, just focusing on the game, but also the politics of it all. We had an opportunity to catch up with a Georgetown professor who actually studies the World Cup and the intersection of politics. I want you to listen to a little bit of our conversation. How significant is it that we are seeing politics collide with sport in this World Cup? I think we should not expect from the 22 players on the pitch to restore the nuclear deal. That's the job of the governments. But what the players can do, they can compete with each other hard but fair and can send a strong signal for a good understanding between the people of the two countries. We are living in an age of athlete activism. The times of shut up and dribble are over. We have now athletes who express their political views. Could we see the Iranian team jailed because of what they did on the field? Unfortunately, in Iran, everything is possible. What the Iranian players did was very brave. Um, they, are, they are risking their own lives. They are risking the lives of their families in Iran. Um, but it clearly shows that they have uh, sympathy and solidarity with the protesters. Yeah, so that last question that I asked Dr. Reich there, I mean, he was referring to the fact that we saw the Iranian national team at their first game not singing the national anthem. Uh, when they took the field just the other day, they did sing, some of them looking begrudgingly. Um, so all eyes are going to be on this game tonight. A lot at stake here for both sides. Yeah. And, and you, you, yeah, you know, Megan, the thing is that for people to, to, to get a sort of a feel about how intense this rivalry is, or at least how intense the Iranians are feeling about this. You talk about that press conference yesterday 
And uh, I, the, the anger from the Iranian, I guess it's Iranian state media going after the coaches, but then attacking our captain, Tyler Adams, um, and, and first of all going, you mispronounced our country's name. Yeah, be how disrespectful of you, and how could you play? You know, how can you play for a team where there's so much racism in your country? And that uh, again, the hypocrisy coming from Iran. Uh, but I, I was blown away by by Tyler Adams' response. What a captain! I mean, first of all, he said, "Well, first of all, I'm very sorry uh, for mispronouncing." You know, he said Iran instead of Iran. Uh, but secondly, I thought it was fascinating. He said, I've, I've been all around the world, and I've seen there's racism all around the world. That, but what I love about the United States is we continue to work on it. We continue to try to get better. And I thought the grace uh, under fire was extraordinary. But I did take note the anger and the hostility towards the Iranians for him even mispronouncing the name of their country, uh, not saying Iran instead of Iran, I thought it was very revealing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the way in which we saw our team captain responding with such class, uh, with such composure. I mean, we're talking about kids in their 20s. I mean, these are young men, of course. Uh, but the composure that he showed, even under fire, even under what seemed to be uh, some frustration, we could at least call it that, from the Iranian state media there, um, really just grilling them. Uh, and, and the fact that he said, look, as you mentioned, I've traveled all over the world. I've seen discrimination all over the world. World. But here in America, we're conscious of that, and there is an effort to try and improve and get better. We're talking about other issues aside from the game. Now this young man has to rally up his, his team and hit the field today and really try and deliver a win with all of these things circulating. Um, so, you know, you really have to give it to Team USA because they have a lot going on right now as they try and focus on what they came to Qatar for, which is to try and win a World Cup title. All right, NBC's nice. Megan Fitzgerald, live from Doha, Qatar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, have fun there, <laughs> at least during the game, if you can. Um, so, Caddy K, uh, not word association here. We're going to do year association. Oh, I'm just going to name a random year. And you, you tell me what comes to mind. Oh, I wouldn't want to play this game. What are you no, doing? I, 1966. Is... 1966, yeah. Caddy. <laughs> I see she knows. Okay. Yeah, so we're not going there again, right? I mean, the state of that yeah. game that we played against the USA the other day, it didn't look so good for the England team. I'm hoping you've just spoken about one great rivalry today, which is USA-Iran match, but you completely forgot to mention the England-Wales match, which, where I come from, is almost as big a rivalry uh, that is happening at the same time to see who comes out of Group 1. Um, the Prince of Wales actually asked who he was supporting in this, which might be a little awkward given that he is the Prince of Wales, but clearly English, and had to admit <laughs> that he was clearly English. Uh, no, I, I don't. I thought you guys looked great um, over the weekend on Friday. Uh, you, it's a younger, fitter team than the English team, and. Uh, yeah, the, the Doha weather is tough on teams that don't have stamina. By that 90th minute, yeah. they are dripping with sweat. So I'm not sure this is going to be. A, I don't know. I, I, I should yeah. be. I should be a good American optimist and say yes. This is the year that England is going to win the World Cup again. Yes, and of course, Willie, 1966, the last year that England brought the World Cup home. Uh, and the pressure is mounted through the years. Uh, we'll see what happens. I will say, though, uh, Caddy's right. Um, a lot of cramping, especially from those teams from Northern Europe. Like, who would have ever foreseen <laughs> that if you if you held a World Cup in in Doha, that that you would have cramping problems and like nine or ten minutes added to each match. And that's after they moved it out of summer. The World Cup's supposed to be in summer, so all the teams can you know be together and not be in their professional teams. But it was going to be 110 or 115 during the game, so they moved it to the fall, ostensibly, theoretically, to avoid all the cramping and all the problems we've seen. So. We'll focus on the action in the field, but boy, there's a lot to talk about off the field with this World Cup in Qatar. 